walked by faith, not by sight. I want to explain something to you. We as Israelites do not serve your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, that is your God. That is something created by the Roman Catholic Church for you all and for a deception to everyone else. Okay, we are Israelites. Okay, our origins are of Hebrew origin, right? And so we serve our master. Yahuwah, okay, and his son's name is not JC, it is Yahusha Hamashiach, okay, and so it is pointless for you to continue to tell us to repent and turn back to this person who we were never supposed to be turned to in the first place, you see, many of us in our ignorance, we served and worshipped a false god, okay, you all call him God, Lord, Jehovah, uh, Jesus Christ, all of this other stuff, in our ignorance, we followed after that. But see, the Most High knew our hearts and that our heart was with our Heavenly Father. We just didn't know His right name. And so now that we know His right name, there is no need for you all to continue to tell us that we need to turn back to your Lord and Savior. That is your Lord and Savior, okay? Not ours. Called it a Christian book. It's not a Christian book. See that? You, there is no power in the name of Jesus. We're a Christian. We talked about the third eye on the Watchman reports. And that's what Christianity is. It's a pagan religion. Why I'm no longer a Christian. So you can take your Christian rhetoric somewhere else and go and evangelize your people and try to get them to come into your fold, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, what is a Christian? Well, in order to find out what a Christian is, we have to consider what our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ said in the Gospels. Uh, let's look in uh, John chapter 3 and hear what he has to say. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are, are passed away. Behold, old things have become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. But if we go back into the book of Acts, this is what it says. It's then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is upon becoming a Christian is all about believing on Christ. In fact, the work of God is this, and it's not too difficult to grasp. This is the work of God, to believe in, in him whom he has sent. That's what it is all about, believing on Jesus Christ. So out of Deborah's own mouth, Deborah has admitted that she's no longer a Christian. She no longer is a follower of Jesus Christ. She no longer believes in the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And this is very important going forward because the things that you're going to hear her teach is coming out of her own heart and does not come from the Holy Spirit and is not supported by the church. The whole world has been captivated by fake images and fake names and they say uh, the name is just a translation there's nothing wrong with the name being translated into your own language we think it was translated into to, um, English 
that's a Latin name. And Jesus in Latin means earth pig. I double dare you to go look it up yourself. Hmm. All right, I'll take up. I'll take you up on that challenge. Let's uh, do this. Some people claim that our Lord should not be referred to as Jesus. Instead, we should only use the name Yeshua. Some even go as far as to say that calling him Jesus is blasphemous. Others go into great detail about how the name Jesus is unbiblical because the letter J is a modern invention and there was no letter J in the Greek or Hebrew. Yeshua is the Hebrew name and its English spelling is Joshua. Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name, and its English spelling is Jesus. Thus, the names Joshua and Jesus are essentially the same. Both are English pronunciations of the Hebrew and Greek names for our Lord. For examples of how the two names are interchangeable, see Acts chapter 7 verse 45 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse 8 in the KJV. In both cases, the word Jesus refers to the Old Testament character, Joshua. Changing the language of a word does not affect the meaning of the word. We call a bound and covered set of pages a book. In German, it's called a book. In Spanish, it's a libro. In French, it's a livre. The language changes, but the object itself does not change. As Shakespeare said, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In the same way, we can refer to Jesus as Jesus or Yeshua or Yisau, Cantonese, without changing his nature. In any language, his name means the Lord is salvation. As for the controversy, over the letter J, it is much ado about nothing. It is true that the languages in which the Bible was written had no letter J, but that doesn't mean the Bible never refers to Jerusalem. And it doesn't mean we cannot use the spelling J-E-S-U-S. If a person speaks and reads English, it is acceptable for him to spell things in an English fashion. Spellings can change, even within a language. Americans write Savior without a U, while the British write Savior with a U. The addition of a U, or subtraction depending on your point of view, has nothing to do with whom we're talking about. Jesus is the Savior with the U, and he is the Savior without a U. Jesus and Yeshua and Iesus are all referring to the same person. The Bible nowhere commands us to only speak or write his name in Hebrew or Greek. It never even hints at such an idea. Rather, when the message of the gospel was being proclaimed on the day of Pentecost, the apostles spoke in the languages of the Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was made known to every language group in a way they could readily understand. Spelling did not matter. We refer to him as Jesus because as English-speaking people, we know of him through English translations of the Greek New Testament. Scripture does not value one language over another, and it gives us no indication that we must resort to Hebrew when addressing the Lord. The command is to call on the name of the Lord with the promise that we shall be saved, Acts chapter 2, verse 21. Whether we call on him in English, Korean, Hindi, or Hebrew, the result is the same. The Lord is salvation. Just to add a little bit more context to what's going on here, uh, we actually do see names changing in different languages. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, this is what it says. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue have his name Apollyon. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. So Deborah is very incorrect on her assessment on uh, Jesus' name meaning earth, meaning earth pig. Uh, it's just a false secret name assessment that she's making um, about Jesus, and um, she's been shown to be wrong on this portion of the show. Um, what I also want to show you to add to this, uh, to, just to give you guys an idea of what, is, what happens when you turn your heart away from Christ. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, things that go bump in the night, fairy tales, stories, things are not true. And that's what's happened to Deborah when she turned her back on Christ.
You hear what I'm saying to you? There is no power in the name of Jesus. And we, there is no power in the name of Jesus. There is no power in the name of Jesus. Build this out. The name of this lesson is, is there any power in the name of Jesus? Can y'all answer that for me? No, there is not. No, there isn't. That's right. And we're going to prove that with scripture today. And That's right. And this lesson is in no way trying to say that the Messiah or uh, <laughs> Yahshua HaMashiach has no power. We're not trying to say that at all. We're just trying to bring some clarification to our people who blindly defend everything that the heathens have given us, regardless to how toxic it has been to us. That's right. We're going to read some of the comments, too, that um, were placed on the, the video that I did a couple days ago, which is um, part of the reason why we decided to do this lesson. Um, my video was not a lesson. It was just a quick um, summation of something that I was feeling. But this is going to be a lesson giving you scripture on why it's important that we come away from all of these pagan names, uh, such as JC. And some of the comments were very uh, interesting from some of the Israelites who know and understand the power of words and names. And I'm, we're going to read some of those comments as well as some of the comments from people who, regardless to what was said, they still defend the name of JC as if that is the saving grace for them in um, their soul. So we're going to do a little recap and go back to the scriptures that we read before the, the broadcast went down. We'll take it from there. That's right. And like my wife said, I want to just let you know, some of you Christians, I know the minute y'all see something like this right away, you want to um, <clears throat> come against it. And all we're asking you to do is hear the whole matter of the subject first. That's what the Apostle Shaul said. <clears throat> Man, please excuse me, I have this sore throat that I've been dealing with. But... Uh, so you got to hear the whole matter of the subject first, okay? Mm -hmm. We are not coming to the Messiah, okay? We believe in the Messiah of the scriptures, okay? We believe in this um, set-apart ruach, the whole, uh, what, what we refer to as the Holy Spirit, the set-apart spirit. You know, we believe in the spirit. We have the spirit. And we preach Yah's truth to people that they should receive the ruach and, and know the, the Son and, and be filled. <laughs> with his word and his truth. So we're not uh, coming against the Savior. So get this through your mind now because we've had plenty of people to hear us say something against the name and right away we're coming against the Savior. No, we're not. We're coming against the name that you're using for the Savior. As a matter okay? of fact, in Whited Out Part 3, we, <clears throat> we even talked about some of these uh, names that were given such as God, Lord, Jesus, and all of these things. Yeah, that's right. Even Christian in Christ. And we talked about the origins of some of these things and where they came from. That's right. And it is unbelievable to me that we, as the real people of the book, still want to fight for what the heathen gave us. That's right. <sighs> Deborah, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of the things in heaven and the things in the earth and the things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The Father. Most of the Hebrew Israelites that have the problem with the name of Jesus is mainly because they get a lot of the, get a lot of the understanding from a movement known as the Sacred Name Movement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a video that's on YouTube that explains what the Sacred Name Movement is and how to refute it, so that you can get a greater understanding of the problems that Deborah and them are presenting and why they have such a hard time accepting that um, his name is Jesus. And it doesn't matter what language you use, as long as it's been properly translated or transliterated. This presentation is an attempt to help good and I believe well-meaning people. People who I believe for the most part should be committed for their thirst for the truth and willingness to go against the grain. But they are also people that I feel have been deceived and led into a type of religious bondage by false brothers similar to that of the Galatians in the Bible. This group is sometimes called the Sacred Name Movement, although they themselves may or may not call themselves by any title, and they are often not connected to one another. It is for the most part 
independent teachers espousing variations of the same type of false teaching. The core belief is that the modern renditions of the name of the Father and the Son are pagan, and that pronouncing the names correctly is either part of how one is saved, or, alternatively, just a way to keep from becoming cursed. There is a strong emphasis that there was a conspiracy to edit out the real names of the Bible in order to get man to worship the wrong God. I will list a few of the topics that I will be discussing. Baal, the name or shame of God, the Tetragrammaton, is Jesus connected to Zeus? Is Zeus or Dios connected to Zeus? How did we get the name Jesus? What is the true pronunciation of Jesus? Are we calling on pagan gods when we call on the modern names of God and Jesus? Does Krishna equal Christ? Where does the word Jehovah come from? What does the Bible say about saying the original Hebrew names? So let's begin with the topic of Baal, because it's something that almost all the sacred namers mention first. The main argument over the use of the sacred name usually goes something like this. The Hebrew words Baal and Adonai mean Lord. Baal and Adonai are also pagan gods of Phoenicia. Therefore, to use the English word Lord in reference to God is blasphemy. Now, if that logic is correct, then we should also argue this way. Molech means king. Molech is a pagan god of the Moabites. Therefore, to use king in reference to God is blasphemy. Another example would be Diana. Diana means divine. Diana was a pagan goddess of the Ephesians and many others. Therefore, to use divine in reference to God would also be blasphemy. You see, these common and general words only became proper nouns over much time. But that did not stop the common word from being a valid word to use. The faulty logic is in the presumption that if a false religion commonly used a title in reference to a false god, then this somehow taints that word and makes it blasphemy to use for the one true god. As validation for their position, the sacred namers show that the god of the Bible calls himself by the Hebrew word Baal on a few occasions. There are a few key Bible verses that are commonly brought up on this point. So let's look at a few of the main ones in detail. Let's start with Hosea 2, verses 16 and 17. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ish, and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. This is taken out of context to mean that there will be a day when God will reteach them the correct way to pronounce his proper name, and he will stop them from speaking the false names of God, which they believe mean Baal. It's actually kind of a shame that the sacred name teachers have more or less stolen the depth and beauty of this verse from their students by simply reading it out of context and then quickly giving an interpretation like the one that I just gave. It is no coincidence that the term Ish in this verse means my husband, and that Baali, which is a form of Baal, means my lord or my master. It is no coincidence because this entire chapter is talking about marriage. In fact, the whole book of Hosea is about marriage in a sense, and so is this verse. This is a good time to introduce you to the 2020 rule. It basically means that you should read 20 verses before and 20 verses after a particular verse to get the context so that you understand what the scripture is talking about. In the book of Hosea, Hosea was directed by God to marry a prostitute, which he did. The prostitute kept sleeping around with other men, even after they were married. And Hosea was surprised when God told him after that to go get her and bring her back into his house and love her and remain married to her despite her unfaithfulness to him. Marriage here is symbolic of the covenantal relationship between God and Israel. Israel has been unfaithful to God by following other gods and breaking his commandments. So Israel is symbolized by a harlot who violates the obligations of marriage to her husband. But Hosea represents God and his grace and mercy to the rebellious Israel and how he keeps bringing her back despite its unfaithfulness. The first part of this chapter is explaining the many transgressions of the symbolic wife, Israel, and how she worshipped other gods, including Baal, and offered sacrifices to him. It talks of what the wife deserves for this adultery, but then in the two verses before these verses that we just read, 
God, in his grace, begins to call her back to him. The two verses before this say, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Angkor for a door of hope. And she shall sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So, even after a long talk of her unfaithfulness and idolatry, God says he will make their relationship like it was after Egypt, when she was faithful. And then we have the passage in question, which says, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ish, and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. The Hebrew words Ish and Baal, the root of Baali, are both translated by the English word husband in other places in the Bible. Ish is a very interesting word, which we will look at in more detail later, but it is translated as husband in 69 verses, while Baal is translated as husband in only three verses. The connotation is that Ish is like a relational husband, and Baal is a lord or a master over his wife. God is saying in this verse that in the future there will be a different relationship between him and his people, and they will call him husband instead of a type of master, and they will be a family, not a type of slave. The fascinating part about this is that the prophet Jeremiah was also told by God to make this exact same prophecy. Also realize as I read it that in verse 32, it's one of the other three places in the Bible where the word Baal is translated as husband, and that's not a coincidence. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. These two prophecies are about a future covenant. Another way to compare them is the last verse in that section in Hosea, which says, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. And that's also how Jeremiah 31, 33 puts it. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This is the interpretation of Hosea 2, verse 17. It literally has nothing to do with the changing of the proper name of God. That interpretation only works out of context and with a false or deceived teacher. Another verse that is used to attempt to show that there was a conspiracy to insert Baal for the true name of God is found in Joshua 11, verse 17. Even from the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal God in the valley of Lebanon, under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took and smote them and slew them. The idea here is that the name of the region Baal God is evidence that the term God in the English language is connected to Baal. They will say things like, if you say that you worship God, you are really worshiping Baal, and this is their proof text. But Baal God is a compound name, and like other places in the region, even to this day, there are compound names using the term Baal. One example is Baalbek, and it no doubt is a place that Baal was worshiped in times past. But the word God, G-A-D, that it's similar in sound to the modern word God, G-O-D, is pure coincidence. The English word God derives from the Proto-Germanic root, and not the Semitic, so it's logically impossible that these words have similar origins. This is one of those that the smart sacred namers refrain from using because of the 100% lack of any etymological evidence. God, G-A-D, is another ordinary common noun in Hebrew that has no connotation to the Lord. It means good luck. Genesis 30:11 says, Then Leah said, What good fortune! So she named him God. So it is not surprising that the Hebrew word for good luck became a proper noun, as we see here in this compound name for this place. The final Baal verse we're going to look at is in Jeremiah 23, verse 26. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. 
The sacred name interpretation is that the lies spoken of here is the editing of the name Baal in the place of God in the text. And now God is upset because everyone has forgotten his proper name. So let's look at these verses in context. Look at the first part. Notice he is talking about prophets and prophecy. It says, How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies, even the prophets of deceit of their own heart? So, it seems that the problem was prophecy. Not that the scribes had changed all the text to a different name. But, if this were true, we should see some evidence that there were false prophets prophesying in the name of Baal. As well as some further evidence that they were causing people to believe Baal instead of God to explain verse 27. Well, that's easy. Just look 13 verses before this and you will find exactly that. And this is another example of the 2020 rule. Jeremiah 23 verse 13 says, And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to err. So when you put this verse with the earlier verses, you will see that they are in perfect harmony. And now that you know the context of the verse, which is that there were prophets of Samaria prophesying by Baal, apparently by going into some kind of dream state, as we see in verse 27, and this was seducing the Israelites to err, it's obvious that this passage is not talking about the proper name of God being changed at all. This brings us to another topic, one that I think is at the very heart of the sacred name ideas, which is the very Hebrew word for name, which is Shem pronounced shame. We might as well stay in the same chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 23, because earlier there is a wonderful prophecy of the Messiah made. It's in verse 6. It says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now, wait a minute. That's not the proper name for the Messiah, is it? What about other places, like in Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, where it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now wait a second, how many names is the Messiah going to have? At the heart of the sacred name movement is a fundamental misunderstanding of the Hebrew word for name, which is shame. Many sacred name teachers basically scare people with verses like this in Psalm 9, verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So, do these verses speak of the proper name, or is name a more broad title than the sacred namers would have us believe? Even in English, we should be able to understand this, because our English word for name has a very broad use as well. Webster's Dictionary says it can be a proper name like Bob, or a designation like he was king in name only, or an appellation, title, epitaph applied descriptively or in honor, or it can be a reputation of a particular kind given by common opinion. An example would be to protect one's good name, or a distinguished, famous, or great reputation like fame. An example would be to make a name for oneself. Or a widely known or famous person or celebrity, like she's a name in show business. Or a personal or family name is exercising influence or bringing distinction. Like, with a name like that, they can get a loan in any bank of town. It can be a body of persons grouped under one name as a family or clan, the verbal or other symbolic representation of a thing, event, property, relation, or concept. Like our English word name, shame in Hebrew has several meanings besides the literal one. One way that it is used in the Bible is to mean the essential reality of who someone is, as in Proverbs 21, 24. A proud and haughty person's shame is scorner. In Exodus 34, 14, we read, The Lord, whose shame is jealous, is a jealous God. In a more famous example, the prophet Isaiah gave him the Messiah's shame as being wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the eternal father, the ruler of Shalom, Isaiah 9, verses 5 through 6. The plural form of shame is shemot. The Bible has many shemot for God, which are royal titles and revelations of the reality of who he is, but not names as such. In biblical Hebrew, to trust someone's shame means to trust him because of who he is. To bless someone's shame 
means to bless him because of who he is. So when you see verses like, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy shame? You can be sure that shame is about who God is. So let's transition from this into the Tetragrammaton, or the four letters YHWH, because it will be an important thing to understand when looking at all the other claims of the sacred namers. The key passage for understanding the Tetragrammaton is in Exodus 3, verses 13. Moses asks God what his shame is. We see that God answers the question in a very interesting way, a way that is to this day a mystery to many scholars. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his shame? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. The Hebrew words for I am that I am is Haya Asher Haya, and the word Haya is the short version meaning only to be, or in this tense, I am. It is most often translated in the Bible as some form of the verb to be. An example would be in Genesis 44, verse 24. It says, And it came to pass, when he came up unto the servant, my father, we told him the words of the Lord. The words, and it came to pass, is the single Hebrew word for Haya, or to be. Yahweh and Haya, or Eya, are both from the same verb, Haya in Biblical Hebrew. Uh, it's spelled Hawa in earlier Hebrew. By the way, the Hawa root does show up in the Biblical Hebrew as well, but it is more common in the Aramaic portions. Yahweh is the third masculine singular form, probably in the Hiphal stem. Eya, or Haya, is the first common singular in the Qual stem. Yahweh would mean he who causes to be, and Eya, or Haya, would mean I am. So, Yahweh is in most places the third person masculine singular conjugation of the root Haya. This is the tense you would use if you were referring to God, as opposed to God referring to himself, because God's name is a verb. It's kind of like in English, if I said my name is I am that I am, other people would refer to me as he is who he is. Keep in mind that this is much too simplistic of an example considering the intricacies of this verb, but you get the idea. There is a sect of sacred namers that say that Haya or Eya is the only true name of God, and that the YHWH or the Tetragrammaton is a Kabbalistic forgery. Now this is of course ridiculous because the Kabbalah is based on Rabbinic Judaism, and the Tetragrammaton predates that by hundreds of years, so that's impossible. The reason they think this is very basic. That is because they appear to be different words. But that totally disregards the fact that Hebrew grammar is the reason why it is rendered YHWH in the third person. I emailed one of the premier scholars of ancient Hebrew alive today, and his response to this question was as follows. When God reveals the covenant name, he says his name is I am that I am. This is the first singular form of Haya. Nothing else it can be. Yahweh is the same root, just a third person grammatically in a different stem. So what is this mysterious word in this mysterious tense called the Tetragrammaton? The term Tetragrammaton comes from the Greek meaning a word having four letters. It refers to the Hebrew name of the God of Israel. These four letters are usually transliterated from Hebrew as IHVH in Latin, JHWH in German, French, and Dutch, and JHVH or YHWH in other languages. The original pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton is difficult to be determined with absolute certainty. The reason is partially because the correct pronunciation has been lost to history due to a fear of breaking the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain, because the late Jewish culture only allowed the high priest to say it. You can look over Hebrew scholarly literature to find the grammatical reasons that there is a lot of speculation on how to pronounce it, but I will simply say that it is a very difficult thing to know with certainty. Which makes me very sad to see all the teachers of the sacred name movement have their dozens of variations of the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, each one saying that God will send people to hell if they don't choose the one that they have come up with based on their particular method. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you the true pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton in this presentation, even though I think I have a good idea. I think it would be presumptuous of me to think that if all the Hebrew scholars combined aren't sure about its pronunciation, 
that I somehow could figure it out beyond any doubt with my research. I hope to give you something much better than that by the end of this presentation, though, and that is the shame of God and freedom from bondage. There are pronunciations that I can be relatively certain are not the correct pronunciations of the Tetragrammaton. One of those that I feel I should mention is Jehovah. And it was probably first used by Raymond Marti, who was a 13th century Catechan Dominican friar and theologian, so it's a pretty recent thing. In early Bible translations, when the reformers started to translate the Bible into their own languages, despite the Catholic Church's opposition and persecutions, William Tyndale was the first to translate considerable parts of the Bible into English. Tyndale spelled the name of God Jehovah. We will look at how he came up with that name in a moment. But because he published in Germany, the German version would transliterate the letter I as J, because in Germany, when they wanted to say the yes sound, they most often used the letter J. Later on, as people read this German translation, they pronounced it differently because, for instance, the French looked at the same letter and pronounced it with a hard J sound, and the English speakers adopted the French practice. The name Jehovah then appeared in all early Protestant Bibles in English, except Coverdale's translation in 1535. The name Jehovah appeared in John Rogers' Matthew Bible in 1537, the Great Bible of 1539, the Geneva Bible of 1560, the Bishop's Bible of 1568, and the King James Version of 1611. More recently, it has been used in the Revised Version of 1885, the American Standard Version of 1901, and the latest one was the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures of the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1961. Notice that there are no modern translations on the list that uses Jehovah other than the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation. Most other modern translations have stopped rendering the name Jehovah. The reason is because the reason the early scholars believed it to be the correct pronunciation is now known to be false. It was not a conspiracy, but an honest mistake. Let's look at it. Some of you are aware that the written Hebrew does not have vowels which were not needed because, for much of its history, Hebrew tradition was passed down orally, and so were the correct pronunciations. Then, over time, as the pronunciations were lost to history, as the language was starting to die out after the diaspora, there was a system of adding vowels created to help modern speakers pronounce the words. This was done by using several dots and other marks that were supposed to signify that you were to use a certain vowel sound when pronouncing the consonants. This was developed in the 13th century by the Masoretes or Masorites, a family of Jewish scribes. It was important to note that it is unlikely that the Masorites even knew the correct pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton. We know this because they, like most late Jewish people, developed a fear of pronouncing the name of God because they were very concerned about breaking the commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain. So, what they did when writing the Tetragrammaton was they substituted terms like Adonai and Elohim, or God, titles for God to replace the divine name. But, instead of actually changing the word, they would only insert the vowel markers of Lord and Adonai, not the words themselves, to indicate to the reader that these substitutes were to be used. So, people would see the Tetragrammaton, yet with the vowel markings of the substitute names. Later on, when modern translators read the Tetragrammaton with the vowel signs for the replacement names, they followed the guidelines of the vowel markings as if they were the true markings of how to pronounce the Tetragrammaton. And this is where the pronunciation of Jehovah or Ehovah came in. But we now know why the vowel markers were there, and we understand that the pronunciation of Jehovah or Ehovah is a filological impossibility. But, as I mentioned, there are more than a few groups out there that have entire doctrines resting on this pronunciation. And so, they say it must be that the vowel points are inspired and that they existed in the earliest forms of Hebrew. This is a view that is not supported by modern scholarship in the main. Let's move on to a different claim. Many sacred namers claim that YHWH is derived from the pagan word for Zeus. In fact, Zeus comes up quite a lot with the sacred namers, and we will look at him again as we investigate the name for the Messiah later on. There are many variations of this claim, which usually means that there is a lot of people simply repeating other sacred namers and not doing any investigation of their own. So, I'm going to have to debunk several variations of this claim. The first claim is that the Latin name for Ihov, or Jove, which is an alternative poetic name for Jupiter, which is the same god as Zeus, is related to the Semitic root Hawa, from which the Tetragrammaton is derived. 
a certain amount of people that make a big deal of this claim basically point to the superficial similarity between the words Jove and Jehovah. But, as we have seen, it doesn't really make any sense because the name Jehovah is about the one name for God that you can rule out. Nevertheless, some take it a step further and say that the Jove is from the Indo-European Dio. And since there's also an early Hindu deity called Diaspita in Sanskrit, and since D in Sanskrit regularly corresponds to Z in Greek and J in Latin, we can be reasonably certain that they go back to something like Dios, or the title Pater, meaning father. The Norse god Tyr probably has a descendant of the same name too. However, it's impossible that Yahweh is related because unlike Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and Old Norse, which are Indo-European languages, Hebrew is from the completely unrelated Semitic language family. It's basically a coincidence, and I might submit not even a particularly profound one. The other claim about Zeus is that it has connotations to Deus, the generic Latin word for God. This one is actually more or less correct, and it's actually one of my favorite claims because people show that the word Deus and Zeus are connected, and they act as if people thought that Deus, or deity, was a name only intended for the one true God, when in fact even the Latin dictionaries say that it's a general term for deity. The Bible in several places refers to other deity, although they are created by God and lesser than him, he still gives them titles as gods or Elohim. In the same way, having a general word for God and gods is natural in many languages, and they derive from all kinds of places. People say that we shouldn't call God, God, but I would say that they are missing the obvious point, which is that it's a noun. It's like saying, the Most High is the one true God, or Baal was a wicked and pathetic God. It's simply a descriptive tool that we have in the English language. Now let's look at the name of the Messiah. Sacred namers will say that using the name Jesus is pagan, or if you use it, you're calling on pagan gods. Is this true? To start off, I will debunk the idea that there is a connection between Jesus and Zeus. This one has become really popular on the internet, but you should know if you believe this that even the majority of the sacred namers don't believe this. They reject it because there's a complete lack of etymological evidence and that people often call them out on this. So here's one quote from a sacred namer website about the Jesus-Zeus connection. It says, we have never used the argument that Jesus is somehow a compound of Jesus, Zeus being the chief god of the Greek pantheon, although there is a certain and extreme degree of assonance, which is the core of the art of transliteration, with the Jesus word. We have never pursued that possibility to any extent since it is totally irrelevant. We know exactly where the name Isius came from. It was a natural Greek way of rendering the Hebrew Aramaic name Yeshua at least two centuries before his birth. And it is the form of the name found in more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. The apostles Paul, Peter, Mark, Luke, Jude all chose to translate Yeshua as Isius when writing in Greek. That should validate that it's not a damnable sin for anyone to transliterate the name. The name Isius is also found in Greek writings outside the New Testament and dating to the same general time frame. Yes, some people claim that the Encyclopedia Britannica says that the name Isius is a combination of two mythical deities, Eu and Zeus or Zeus. It actually says no such thing. It's a total lie. In short, as one Jewish believer said, Jesus is as much related to Zeus as Moses is to mice. Some sacred namers claim that the name Christ comes from the word Krishna, and therefore, if you say Christ, you're giving homage to a pagan god. They quote Albert Pike as a main source for this claim. There is absolutely no etymological similarity between the words Krishna and Christ. The Sanskrit word is called Kursna and has a literal meaning of black or dark or dark blue and is used as a name to describe someone with dark skin. And pictures of Krishna are often depicted with blue skin. Christ is an English term for the Greek word Christos, meaning the anointed. In the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, Christos was used to translate the Hebrew Mashiach, meaning one who is anointed. Christos, in classical Greek usage, could mean covered in oil, and thus it's a literal translation of Mashiach. The Greek term is thought to derive from the Proto-Indo-European root of gere, to rub. Clearly then, why both words have a similar initial sound, 
they have totally different etymologies. Also, Krishna is the proper name for a Hindu deity, whereas Christ is not a proper name, nor is it a surname, it is a title. Christos existed in ancient Greek and is a common word long before it was appended to the Messiah. You can follow me step by step through the transliteration of this name to see how it came about. Transliteration is the practice of converting a text from one writing system into another in a systematic way. As you can see from these graphs, the Y was translated into an I in Greek. This wasn't a conspiracy. This was because there was no Y in Greek, and I was the closest letter available to make that sound. The first sound of the second syllable of Yeshua is the SH sound. It is represented by the Hebrew letter SHIN. However, Greek, like many other languages, has no SH sound. Instead, the closest approximation, the Greek SIGMA, was used for transcribing Yeshua as Isius. The final sigma, or S, added at the end of Isius occurs in the standard transliteration of the proper masculine noun from Hebrew to Greek. Greek nouns and names almost always have case endings. The same is true for names like Nicodemus, or Judas, Lazarus, and others. The sigma, or S, is added at the end of the word to distinguish that the name is the masculine form. It also makes the name declinable. If you notice that the word Isius is rendered in the genitive form as Isio, you'll notice that there is no final sigma. So I hope so far you can see that there is nothing pagan about the name Jesus. So the question is about the J. Why was it added in modern English? Was it a conspiracy? Does the J somehow make the name Jesus pagan? The IA got changed to a JE in order to make it pronounceable for Germans and we English speakers saw their spelling and pronounced it the way we pronounce J's, which we pretty much got from the early French. It's just how languages develop. It is true that Jesus is not how his disciples or his friends pronounced his name. Two questions then arise. One, well, how was his name pronounced then? And the second one can also apply to the Tetragrammaton, which is, are we supposed to say the Hebrew name to be saved, or is there some extra power or blessing for saying his name in Hebrew? So let's look at the first question, which is, what is the true pronunciation of the Messiah's name? Ten Hebrew leaders had the name Yehoshua. The Aramaic form was Yeshua. The sacred name argument is that the name Jesus is a corruption and should be translated Joshua or Yehoshua. But this does not take into consideration that the Aramaic name for Joshua or Yehoshua was Yeshua. Since Aramaic was the spoken language at the time, he would have been called Yeshua. The name Jesus is the Greek equivalent to Yeshua. This Greek transliteration is as close to the Aramaic as the Greek language would allow. Among the Jews of the Second Temple period, the Biblical Aramaic Hebrew name Yeshua was common. Nearly one out of ten persons from that period was named Yeshua. In the Septuagint and other Greek language Jewish texts, such as the writings of Josephus and Philo of Alexandria, Isius is the standard Koine Greek form used to translate both of the Hebrew names Yehoshua and Yeshua. Greek, or Isius, is also used to represent the name Joshua, son of Nun, in the New Testament passages Acts 7, 45, and Hebrews 4, verse 8. It was even used in the Septuagint to translate the name Hosea in one of the three verses where this referred to Joshua, the son of Nun, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 44. So, it's my personal opinion that Yeshua, or Yeshua, is the original form of the Lord's name, but that as we have clearly seen, Isius, or Jesus, is a natural transliteration. The question is, should we use transliterations? Is there a blessing or a curse if we recite the names in the original form? This is a really important question, too, because all the known world transliterates the Hebrew name Yeshua into their own tongue. For example, the Japanese pronunciation is Yaso. The French is Jesu or Jesu, depending on what part of France you're in. In Spanish, it's Jesus. In Arabic, it's Isa. In Fijian, it's Chisu. So are all these people going to perish because they had to transliterate the Lord's name in order to write it? Here are some things to consider about that. The author of the languages of man was the Most High God, who confused the languages at Babel. The assumption that the languages themselves are pagan in origin implies that God is the author of the pagan religions of man. 
Another often overlooked point is that there is nothing in the Bible that would suggest that saying the name of God in Hebrew gives any special power. There is no instance in the Bible of the name of God being a kind of magic word that one must say correctly. I find it kind of funny that we do see this attitude developing much later with the Kabbalah. I say funny because the sacred namers are supposedly doing what they're doing because they don't want to be practicing witchcraft. But if you look at their theology objectively, it's the gospel of incantation, a form of salvation by reciting the appropriate magic formula. In other words, the Kabbalah and witchcraft. The same Luciferian doctrine of secret knowledge is the basis for the rightness before God. By its definition, it's another gospel. As Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9 says, As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you that ye have not received, let him be accursed. One of the best validations of transliterations is the fact that they were used by the apostles and other New Testament Bible writers. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. Paul, Peter, James, John, Luke, and others wrote the name of our Savior in a language that was not Hebrew. If these men were permitted, inspired even, to write the name in Greek, we are also permitted to write and speak the name of our native language. The historical fact is that the New Testament was written in Greek. Therefore, the doctrine of the Hebrew-only sacred name is made invalid. This conclusion will be reached by even the most casual thinker who has the facts at his or her disposal. Therefore, sacred name movement teachers are compelled to fight a futile battle against an obviously original Greek New Testament. One final point is that the original language of Adam was different than the Ugaritic language of Abraham. The Ugaritic language of Abraham was different than the Egyptian language of Moses and the Israelites in Egypt. The Phoenician language adopted by the Israelites 600 years after they came into the Promised Land is not the language of Adam, Abraham, or that of Moses. And finally, although there is a great affinity of Paleo-Hebrew to the Aramaic, these are different languages. God spoke in each language, and in each one described himself by names and titles. We have no proof or evidence that God insisted upon one continuous pronunciation for his names or titles, and these names and titles were the same in all languages. If the evidence of such a fact of proof is missing, how can any man claim something to which God gave or left no testimony? Either the claim is false on the face of the assertion, or it is false because a claim so important if it were true would have an abundance of testimony, and none exists. In other words, search the scriptures. Just look into God's word and find anywhere in the Bible where it says that God commands us to only say his name in one language. My friends, God knows every language under the sun. And if he chooses to express his name, the names of the apostles or any other thing in a different language, that is his prerogative. Again, you won't find anywhere in the scriptures where it says that you can only pronounce his name in Hebrew. Only the sacred namers believe that, and Deborah believes in part what the sacred namers believe. That's why it's important to search the scriptures for yourself so that you can so that you can see when someone's trying to deceive you. Today we're going to talk about um, we're going to continue our merit series, and and this one is going to cover uh, some uncomfortable issues um, in the marriage. Uh, so we have to really excuse the kids on this one. <laughs> yeah, the, the uncomfortable issues we're going to cover um, are not just dealing in marriage, but relationships, period. Mm -hmm. You know, because before there is a marriage, there has to be a relationship. And so <clears throat> there are many vin videos out there where individuals are talking about marriage and what's required and what a woman is to do and what a man is to do. But not a lot of people want to talk about these uncomfortable issues. So, right. um, hey, me and Brother Yahoo, we're going to cover some of those issues <laughs> today. We're going to talk about yeah. the things that other people don't want to talk about because it's very important that we start to shed some light on these things because marriage in the sight of Yah is a very holy thing, a very set-apart thing that we're supposed to enter into. And you know the scripture says, um, whom Yah have joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, not every marriage was a union put together by the Most High. 
So this is what we want to talk about. You know, one of the issues we want to talk about, you know, in terms of who are we to marry? Because not every marriage is a union of the Most High. That's right. Um, <laughs> you know, the scripture, um, you know, we hear it all the time. We, we talk to different people on the Internet and they ask about um, marrying someone out of our race. And, you know, the scripture talks about it in the Old Testament. It mentions about um, uh, marrying a stranger. So we want to we wanna look into some of these scriptures and um, cover them. So let's go to the first one here is um, Ezra's chapter 10. Ezra chapter 10. Ezra chapter 10. Verse 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of those uncomfortable topics we were talking about. <laughs> marrying people of another nation. That's right. Because some of us seem to have rewritten the scripture on that. You know, some of us have our own interpretation of what the scripture means and who we are to marry. And we do this because of our flesh. We, we're we saying, well, you know what? I know the Father has laid the law out, but I'm going to have to change it up a little bit because it don't go according to what I want. That's right. So we done made a new set of rules for ourselves. And we have to understand, when you, whenever you write your own scripture and you interpret things according to your own flesh, there's going to be a price to pay. And so That's these right. are some of the things we're going to talk about today yeah well, i want to we're going to talk about judgment and we're going to see if we see the same type of thing going on in our society mm -hmm. so i want you to really pay attention to what we show you here okay now let's look at uh, chapter 10 uh start at verse 1 it says now when ezra had prayed and when he had confessed weeping and casting himself down before the house of god their assembly their there assembled unto him out of Israel a great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have transgressed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such are born of them according to the counsel of my, my God. And those that tremble at the, at the commandment of our God, let it be done according to the law. Wow. Now, that's a touchy subject because there are people out here that say, well, you know, I, I, I uh, married out of the race and, and you know, and, and, and so what you're telling me here is I got to put, now I'm not telling you anything, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just showing you what the word is saying here, okay? Sometimes I feel like we are fighting an uphill battle as a people and many have gotten to the point where they just don't care anymore and so... Uh, they are starting to bend and twist to every wind of doctrine that is coming at them. I'm starting to see more and more of our people um, actually stating, teaching, or believing that there was no prohibition to marrying other nations. Our people are starting to teach more and more that it was and is permissible. So many scriptures that are readily available are being overlooked and the claim is that um, you have people uh, misinterpreting scripture that's what a lot of people are saying or taking them out of context or applying their own meaning now the thing that they are saying that uh, those of us who believe that we're not allowed to marry these other nations the thing that they're saying that we are doing is exactly what they are doing because it was made very clear in scripture. Very, very clear. If I remember, I will put a link to uh, videos in the description area that are packed with scripture that tell you very clearly that it was not permitted for Israelites to marry these other nations. And it had nothing to do with the fact that they were serving strange gods only. It wasn't just serving of strange gods. There were prohibitions that the Most High laid out that had nothing to do with that. 
but is the subject of those who are married to Gentiles. Now, I have received the question from both sides, from men and women, but it's mostly brothers who um, have an issue or a problem with this particular thing. Now, the question was this. If I didn't know I was an Israelite and I come into the truth and I'm married to a white woman and we have children together, what do I do with my family? Do I just break up my family? Well, most people that ask that question, I'm going to say this because I'm not going to really deal with this question in the way that you think. I'm going to come from a whole other angle, okay? Most people who ask that question already know the answer. They already know what the Bible says in many places. They already know the solution to repenting for this. They already know what the scripture says. They already know what the Most High requires. But they, because they can't shake their fist at the Most High, they want to get a, another person. They want to get people like myself and others who create videos and do lessons on these particular topics. They want us to answer the question so that they can come out swinging and and, and boxing and anger and bitterness and harsh words towards the messenger. Because they know that they cannot fight with the Most High. And so they want us to answer what the Bible already says. They, they want you to say the solution when it's already there. Okay? And so what I'm going to do, I'm not going to deal with that question in the way that you think, but I'm going to come from a different angle as I stated earlier. The angle I'm going to come from is this, the, the utter hypocrisy that I see from some of our brothers. I find it amazing that so many brothers can so easily divorce and walk away from their black wife and their black children and don't ever look back. They don't look back. I've seen this done so many times in my own family and family, uh, friends of family, neighbors, just in the community in general, I have seen black men walk away from black women and their children never to return again and don't even, don't even want to be in the children's lives, right? And they don't feel anything about it. They just do it. And, you know, there's a song about it. Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And these rolling stones, they usually drop their seed all over the neighborhood, all over the city sometimes. When you got a brother over on the um, west side who has uh, half a dozen sisters and brothers spread it out on the east side. <laughs> you see? But anyway, you have these brothers who like to grow a conscience all of a sudden when they have a white woman and mixed children. All of a sudden, conscience kicks in, and they say, well, what am I supposed to do about my wife and kids? Are you saying that I'm supposed to break up my family because it's against Torah, it's against the word of the Most High? I'm not saying anything. I don't have an opinion on it. I don't have an opinion on it. If you want to know the answer to that, there are plenty of scriptures for it in which many of you already know the answer. But like I said, you know you can't shake your fist at the Most High. You know he's not changing his mind. So you want to just come out swinging and angry at the messenger. But when I look at the sadness in the eyes of so-called black children whose dads have left them. Now there are cases that I know of in which I've shared this story before. And my mom is okay with it. Um, I got her permission before I shared it the first time. But my stepdad, my stepdad, was pretty much in our lives since the time we were very young children. You see, and <clears throat> he, he was a good provider, okay? He made sure we had food, he made sure we had shelter, he bought my mom a home, and you know, he did all of that good provider stuff. But there came a time, because my mom couldn't have any more children, so there came a time when he started messing around with Becky Lou, whatever her name is, I know her real name, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> he started messing around with Becky Lou. Then he ended up getting Becky Lou pregnant. And he had a child with Becky Lou. And he had said to my mom one time that he's not leaving his child for anyone. And my mom said, I never told you to, <laughs> you know. But you see how he got on the defensive about that? I ain't leaving my child for no one. And my mom never even said anything to him about that. 
but it was the strong allegiance that he had with this big overweight fat white woman the strong allegiance he had to her and now their son looks like a big giant tall um mixed Paul Bunyan <laughs> I'm being serious about that that's what he looks like but this man had all this allegiance for this fat white woman and this child that they had together to the point where even when what well, even when he wasn't asked he said I'm not leaving my family for nobody I'm talking about his white family and his, his white wife and his mixed son because he eventually married her after he and my mom got divorced but I've seen so many cases. I've, I, I heard of a, one sister told me that her um, cousin uh, was married to a black woman. And they had, I forget how many children, but they had children together. And then he goes off. He didn't, he didn't marry this white woman, but he had children with her. And so he completely turned his back on his black children. Don't call them. Don't visit them. Don't have nothing to do with them. And his parents, who had already established a good relationship with their grandchildren, with, the, with his black wife, one year they had gotten gifts for their grandchildren, their black grandchildren. He brings his behind over to the house, picks up the gift, takes the gifts, and gives it to his mixed children that he had with Miss Becky Lou White Woman. I said, our brothers are, they got a lot of nerve. Many of our brother have a lot, brothers have a lot of nerves. They are going against the Most High's word, against his law. They are dissing the daughters of Zion. I mean, just blatantly cutting off his wife and kids. But then all of a sudden, they just grow this big, giant conscience. When, when the truth comes forward, that they were never supposed to be with these white women in the first place. They don't want to hear it. They ain't got one scripture to support it. They use that same sorry line over and over that you are what your father is. When they know good and doggone well that that scripture was talking to the 12 tribes of Israel. It was not talking about these heathen nations. And those of you who keep bringing up um, Moses and um, Yosef and all of these other examples in the Bible of people that were married into our people well Moses married that woman before the law was given so did Yosef the law had not yet been established the Most High said look I have got to set some guidelines because my people are erring in their ways so then the law was established and it was no longer permissible for our people to do these things so for those of you who want to keep justifying sin which is transgression of the law, there you have it. Okay, there's a lot of problems with what Deborah just said. A lot of problems. But let's get to the meat and potatoes of what she was uh, primarily talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And this is what it says. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Pezzarites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter uh, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take uh, unto thy son. Verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that God doesn't want the Israelites to get involved with these nations because they will turn their hearts away from God. That is God's primary concern. He wants his people to be faithful and loyal to him. He does not want them to um, doesn't want them falling falling away or worshiping other gods and, and dealing with a person who has a different faith will ultimately do that and we see this later on in scripture and we're going to get to that a little later okay but that's important to know that verse four here where it says for they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods so will the anger of the lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly there's no talk there of because they're a different race 
or anything like that. It has to do with their loyalty to their false gods. Now, we have examples of this in scripture where, unfortunately, uh, an, an, an Israelite got involved with somebody and their hearts got turned away from God. It was a major event in scripture. Is in 1 Kings 11. I talk about this on this channel a lot. In 1 Kings chapter 11, this is what it says. But, but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Um, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and the Hittites. Let me read that again because I want to read the kind of women that, that he got involved with again. But the king of Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. So they was Egyptians, right? The women of the Moabites, the, Am the Ammonites, the Edomites, and the Zidonians, and the Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye should not go unto them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn your heart over, turn your heart after their gods. And Solomon claimed to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of his uh, of David his father. For Solomon went after Asherah, uh, of the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, and the abominations of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. So again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's actually going on here. God is God is not happy with the fact that Solomon got involved with these women and started worshiping other gods. That was his main concern. Never forget what it says in the book of Exodus. I am the, I, I am the Lord thy God that I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is very important to understand when we're talking about this topic. Again, the warrior is focusing more on race than she's focusing on the, 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 you know, the meat of the matter. Now, we have to know something about the Most High himself. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is, this is what it says. It says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, for the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This is something that we learn about the Most High, and something that we learn about Almighty God the father of our Lord and our savior, Jesus Christ, we, we, we learn that God is not like us. He doesn't look at this. He judges the heart. He goes by the heart. And if you don't understand the situation that's going on here, uh, the prophet Samuel is looking for the next king of Israel. And God, re and God rejected all of the people that, or, you know, all of the brothers that he was looking at. And he ultimately chose David, a person that was tending to sheep. We all know that David would eventually be a person not the God's own heart. But the point of me bringing all this up is, is this. God did not want Israel to get involved with the other nations, not because of the color of their skins. No, I'm sorry, the color of their skin. But because they would turn their hearts, turn the Israelites' hearts away from God, as did with Solomon. There's another passage in the scripture that talks about this as well. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 11, and this is what it says. Judah have dealt, has dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah have profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and he hath married the daughter of a strange God. Okay? So, it's not about uh, getting involved with somebody because of skin color. It has to do with what these people actually believe. We actually see this confirmed in the New Testament when it's taught uh, like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And this is what it says. Be ye not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? Okay. Again, God is concerned about his people getting involved with somebody who has a different belief system and having their hearts turn away from God. There are plenty of examples of where we have heard stories where somebody who was a Christian married a Muslim and then they eventually became a Muslim. Or they married somebody who was an atheist and eventually became an atheist. You know what I mean? God is always concerned about 
what the other person believes and whether or not they're going to turn that person's part away. I'm going to give you even more uh, evidence of this when we uh, go to the book of Ruth. Okay? Because this is a situation where you have a Gentile getting married to an Israelite and God actually being pleased with it. Even to the point that this is one of the ancestors of Jesus. In Ruth chapter 1 verse 16, this is what it says. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Okay? Ruth had converted into believing what the Jews believe. And now since the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was going to be her God, and the Israelites was going to be her people, God did not have a, did not have a problem. You will not find anywhere in Scripture, nowhere, where God is rebuking Boaz for marrying Ruth. But you will, you will hear a lot of Hebrew Israelites use eisegesis to twist Scripture to make it sound like you can't marry nobody from the other nations. Okay? And by the way, uh, Deboria, Ruth was under the law, and so was Boaz. Okay, so you can't use that as an example. And there are other examples, but for the sake of time, I want to move on. I want to read James chapter 2. And we're going to do some reading here. We're going to read all the way to verse 10 to get the wisdom of God on this particular matter, right? My brethren, and this is what it says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Okay? For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and in gold apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and that would mean good clothing for those who heard me say that, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts hearken my my beloved brethren have not god chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he have promised to them that love him but ye have despised the poor do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and have convinced the, and, and has convinced of the law as transgressors. Verse 10 in the last verse. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Okay? In this context, they're talking about showing favoritism to people based on their appearance. You got one person that looks rich, and you got another person, another person that looks poor. And they're showing favoritism to the rich. That is not how we're supposed to be. Just like we're not supposed to be superficial people that goes on somebody's physical appearance, we ought to look at a person's heart. And that's how you determine whether or not that person is wife material or whether or not, you, or whether or not that person is going to be pleasing to God. Okay? Again, when we look at a person like Ruth, Ruth was not an Israelite. Ruth came from a Gentile nation, okay? And she converted uh, to the Israelites' beliefs by saying that their people are going to be my people and their God is going to be my God. And as long as the person is willing to convert, then you're free to marry them. You're free to fellowship with them. But to simply tell somebody that, it, that, that it's a sin to marry somebody because of the color of their skin is, is absolute ridiculous. There's nothing like that taught in scripture whatsoever. Again, uh, please understand that according to 1 Peter, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And the devil is the father of lies. Protect yourself against false teachings and false teachers like the Borean from redirecting.
Shalom family. Some of you may have seen when we talked about the third eye on the Watchman Reports channel here on YouTube. I'm going to talk about it again um, from another perspective. Because I don't believe that many of us as so-called black people understand what the third eye is. We associate it with Egyptology. We associate it with wickedness. We associate it with um, something that is opposite of the Most High. When in reality, understanding the third eye is, is basically science. If you were to dissect a human skull and cut in a certain direction, you will see the pineal gland. Okay, The connection between the third eye is really the pineal gland. It was just given that very odd, strange name for whatever reason. So that being said, no longer do I need to refer to it as the third eye but simply the pineal gland, which is something that is within every human body, okay? Now, what I do see happening is that for so long, um, I believe that our pineal glands, talking about so-called black people, has been covered, okay? It's like our eye has been, our senses have been covered. Our um, spiritual connection has been blocked, Okay, um, and I'll even go as far as to say um, another dimension of our of who we are has been interrupted by the cares of this life by those who operate under the powers of darkness. Okay, when the scripture talks about spiritual wickedness in high places, um, that spiritual wickedness in high places operates through people, through groups of people on this planet. Okay, and these people have really, really tapped into their evil power. And part of the power that they've tapped into gave them enough wisdom to know that they have to interrupt our sense of knowing through blocking or covering up our, our pineal gland or um, programming us, so to speak. All of what you see happening in the so-called black community around the world is a result of witchcraft and programming, okay? The, the pineal gland that we have has been programmed towards something to actually deflate us from power, okay? It's kind of like, imagine a balloon, and that balloon is filled with air or spirit or ruach or whatever, okay? Now imagine wicked people knowing that this is your source of power in that balloon. They send all kinds of fiery darts and needles to deflate you, to deflate me. That is what has happened to us, if I can use that analogy. Now this is a very dangerous false doctrine because this woman is going to teach that this is taught in the Bible. Our power or our soul or our spirituality is not found in a gland in our head or in between our eyes or anything like that. Our soul is this. The Bible says that God breathed, and breathed the breath of life into Adam and we became a living soul. We are a living soul. And the power that we Christians use or the power that we have comes directly from God. The power to be able to be obedient to his word. The power to be able to, ser to, to serve him. But this teaching of the third eye is nothing more than a Eastern mystic religion that is used in various different religions, including uh, the New Age movement. So what I want you guys to do is I want you all to take a look at this video so that you can understand a little bit more about this topic. So what is referred to as the third eye is... We always said Shiva will open his third eye and he can burn up the whole existence if he wants. You need to understand, this is a dialectical culture. You don't take these things literally, logically. You need to always read behind it. Unfortunately, people start interpreting it as a logical thing and its whole thing is so badly distorted. Dimensions which cannot be expressed logically are always packed up in these kinds of stories so that they are preserved without distortion. <laughs> so Shiva opens his third eye and either everything burns up or he sees everything clearly. 
So third eye is not a, a physical thing. It is just that if your energies reach a certain peak within you, you have a new clarity of vision of life. You see everything from a completely different dimension. So you start seeing things. It's an inner eye, we say. We can say you can turn it inward or outward, whichever way you turn it. So these eyes are only outward. You can't roll your eyeballs inward and see what's within you, isn't it? So third eye is both ways. If you want, you can turn it inward or you can turn it outward. Whichever way you are seeing life beyond the normal limitations of your perception. Your perception has risen beyond the physical. That is the third eye. Why is it connected to a particular spot in your body? Among the seven chakras, the sixth dimension is called as Agna. Agna is located slightly above the, where the eyebrows meet. There are three dimensions attached to it. These three dimensions are traditionally named after Shiva, three different forms of Shiva. But these three are actual experiential points in the body, where if your energy moves to that point, your experience of life alters itself. The whole process of whatever spiritual process you're doing consciously or unconsciously is fundamentally to move to a higher plane of perception, isn't it? Yes? You call it God, you call it Kundalini, you call it Yoga, you call it what you want. But fundamentally, the whole thing is to raise your perception from a limited physical perception to a higher possibility. So if your energies are in the lowest chakra, which is referred to as the Mooladhara, food and sleep will be the most dominant factors of your life. Only food and sleep. You will not know anything else. If energies move into Swadhisthana, then you are a pleasure seeker. You enjoy the physical world in so many different ways. If your energies move into Manipuraka, then you are a doer in the world. You are an achiever. If your energies move into Anahata, you're a creative person. Maybe you're an artist, you're a painter, you're something, you, you're more creative about life. If your energies move into Vishuddhi, if they become dominant there, you are a powerhouse. Power need not just mean this. Human beings can be powerful in so many different ways. So, this is the power center. If energies move into your Agna, then you have clarity of vision. Scientific proof that's backing up that uh, spiritual enlightenment comes from our pineal gland, known as the third eye, and depicted as ancients as the seat of the soul. And here with more is spiritual coach, Ronnie Hatchwell. Coach, mentor, all of the above. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. This is so cool. You sent me this video yeah. like a few weeks ago, and it really kind of put it together in a way that, you know, we've talked about, people have talked about, we're, it's such a massive time of change and enlightenment. Absolutely. What does that mean and how does the, you know, the pineal gland kind of assist us in that process? Well, we're going through an evolution right now, you know, I mean, human beings aren't meant to stand on, in the same place. But um, we were being used to using our five senses up till now and it's very limiting because, you know, we see, we smell, we hear, but what? So the pineal gland is actually, uh, it's located in the middle down here and it correlates to what we call the third eye. You can't see the third eye, but it's what we call the sixth sense. That means that it's seeing beyond what the five senses see. And uh, what's happened is that, I mean, this is a secret that they've known in ancient Egypt. They know it in the Vatican. You, everywhere you go in the Vatican, you see this pine. pine. Right, and no one right. knew what it was. Yeah. I want to continue. Okay, when we're talking about the third eye, we're talking about uh, what a lot of people would refer to as ESP, all right? And the Bible does talk about this to a certain extent, all right? For those of you who don't know what ESP is, it is extra sensory perception. It is by the means we acquire information through any sense other than the five basic senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and, or hear, and hearing or other well-documented uh, scientific psychological senses, depending on one's culture and beliefs. A sixth sense can be attributed to anything from a spiritual to the technological. Parapsychology addresses uh, certain types of ESP, such as those possessed uh, by psychics and mediums, including clairvoyance, 
telekinesis and communication with the dead. The Bible makes it clear that these types of experiences should be avoided. We should not exercise any sort of spiritual abilities outside of the realm of what the Bible deems acceptable, nor should we consult with anyone who does so. That would mean Deborah or anyone who's teaching these things. If such a thing as a sixth sense or a third eye truly exists, it is not of God. Those who claim to practice such abilities are either deceivers or self-deceived, or and or uh, is under the power of demonic forces. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 says, Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out. And so make yourselves unclean. I am the Lord. All right. Then if you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 33 verse 6, it says, and he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hanum and used fortune telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 27 says, A man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall be surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Isn't it ironic, ladies and gentlemen, that Deborah, when she was talking about marriage and not getting involved with the nations and trying to argue that God didn't want them simply not to be involved with them because of their religious beliefs, because obviously God didn't want them to learn what it is that these people were teaching other people. But isn't it ironic that when she turned her back on Christianity and now she's claiming to be an Israelite, that she's doing the exact same things that the Israelites were forbidden to do? I find that ironic. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God um, has been given to each of us who has received salvation through faith uh, in Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 9 talks about, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life, I'm sorry, the spirit is life of righteousness. If the spirit, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who we, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. All right. So in short, guys, we are obviously forbidden uh, to to dive into these kind of things. We have freedom in Christ. Yes, I understand it. However, we are not to, to, to dive into this whole, you know, uh, sixth sense thing and, and, and this so-called third eye, which is not of God. These are what the heathens practice, the pagans practice, who practice who, the people who are mediums and psychics and things of that nature. Lastly, I want to warn the body of Christ about this, about this third eye doctrine. You see a lot of people wearing this stuff as tattoos and they think it's very fashionable. But it is also, uh, the all-seeing eye is also something that is used by occultists to glorify Lucifer. All right. And I believe it is going to be one of the predominant symbols and one of the predominant teachings when the man of sin actually returns. When he tells you that you have to open up your, that it, that, that it is good for you to open up your third eye so that you can reach some so-called enlightenment. My friends, uh, heed the words of Jesus Christ when he said, let no man deceive you by any means. It was called Hebrew Israelites infiltrating the church. Now, someone shared that link with us, and so yeah. we just we were able to sit in on the end of that um, discussion. It's a Gentile, and some of you may be familiar with vocab Malone, but um, anyway, um, in the discussion, of course, you know they are just against it. Uh, they say that we're infiltrating the black church specifically. Yeah. Now, um, the reason we wanted to talk about this is because 
these Gentiles, um, they are under the belief that we are not the Israelites. That is what they believe. Right. And um, um, I actually got in on the end of the chat, and I said it's not the burden of proof is not on us. That's right. Okay, to to me because we have the scripture. Yes. Okay, the per, the burden of proof is on them to prove that we are not the Israelites. We actually have facts. You know what I'm saying? If you, if you if the, here's the thing, right? First of all, I would like to say to some of these um, Gentiles, and especially to Vocab Malone, first of all, you know that those that the people that are in the land today that call themselves Israel are not true Israel. Mm -hmm. That's easy to prove. All you got to do is go and Google it, and you'll see that they're not. Many of their own people, historians and teachers, are coming forth today, and they're saying, hey, hey we know, okay, we know that, that this people is a, it's a third um a uh, 13, tribe. 13 <laughs> tribe. tribe, yeah. Right. Exactly. So right. that's just a bunch of, uh, so then, if they're not who I. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to say, too, it's not that Hebrew Israelites are infiltrating the church. The Most High, Yahuwah, is infiltrating the church. Yes. And from, the, from listening to the portion of the, that broadcast that I did say, it sounds to me that a lot of these Gentile, these Gentiles are worried. Yeah, they are. Okay, so they believe that uh, there is an infiltration of the church taking place because our people are waking up. More lies from Deboria and her husband, the Watchman. You know, Vocab Malone has been a vexation to the Hebrew Israelites ever since he started his ministry of exposing these people as being identity theft folk who are pretending to be something they are not. And Volcat Malone gets a lot of grief as well for being Caucasian doing these things. But no one can deny that Volcat Malone is actually doing what God has called him to do. And that is to expose the lies of the Hebrew Israelites. And he's not alone. There's Cherry Love. Obviously myself. G-Con. Surreal. And many other faithful brothers and sisters that are not Caucasian that are doing the exact same work in bringing uh, or exposing the Hebrew Israelites for the liars that they are, for the false teachers and heretics that they are. But my friends, the Bible does not teach that there's going to be an end time awakening where the Hebrew Israelites are going to realize their identity. All right. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that in the latter times, some are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says that before the man of sin is revealed, before the day of the Lord, that there will be an end time apostasy. Deborah would know all about that since she already claims that she used to be a Christian and she came into the so-called truth that she's an Israelite. These, these Hebrew Israelites that are infiltrating the churches and barging in and trying to, you know, if I can be a little funny here, acting like Moses saying, let my people go, are coming into these churches, are being very disrespectful and catching people off guard who does not know how to deal with a lot of the heretical teachings. It is not the Most High or God doing this. Rather, it is her Most High or God that is doing these things. And that would be her father, Satan, the father of lies, the one who desires to sift the, Bible, the, the body of Christ as wheat, the one who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Deborah and her husband, like so many other people, have been deceived into the lie to believe that the Bible teaches <laughs> that the Israelites will no longer suffer from amnesia, will realize who they are, and will keep these laws, statutes, and commandments. That is not what the scripture teaches. And we have talked about that on other shows and other events, like the G Podcast, Sister Cherry's Google Hangouts, all over Cat Malone's channel, and in other places. My friends, it is important that you do your own research 
and you actually go and look up and see why so many people are coming out against these fake Hebrew Israelites who claim that they are speaking from God. Take this documentary, for example. How many times did we see Deborah in this, in, in this video do what God commanded the Israelites not to do? In Deuteronomy chapter 7, God told the Israelites not to, for example, not to marry the other nations because they would turn their hearts away from God. Right? Why? Because they would learn what these people believed and put them into practice. This woman teaches the third eye, a third eye false doctrine. She teaches falsehood when it comes to marriage. She teaches a lot of falsehood that we have discussed on many times, many occasions. They even have a demonic series called White It Out, where they misrepresent Christ, the church, on a regular basis. We all know that the litmus test to determine whether or not someone is actually a follower of Christ is to simply ask them about Jesus. And Deborah, out of her own mouth, hates the word Jesus Christ. They can't even say it a lot of times. They call him JC. So please, if you've learned anything from, um, from this documentary, stay away from false teachers like Deborah and the Watchmen. They are not speaking on behalf of the Most High. And they are speaking out of their own greedy bellies so that they can, so that they can turn you into merchandise and try to make as much, as much money on, online as humanly possible. There is one God, and he is the maker of heaven and earth. And he made us in his image and likeness, male and female, with dignity, value, worth, and purpose. He made us to worship. And we chose to sin against him, to rebel against him, to disobey him. As a result, we are separated from God and we live under the foolish myth that to some degree we are each our own God, declaring right and wrong and living our own life by our own standards. And that God lovingly came into human history as the man Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. That he was born of a virgin and he lived a life without sin, though he was tempted in every way as we are. And he went to the cross and there he substituted himself. Our first parents in the garden substituted themselves for God. And at the cross, Jesus reversed that substitution and substituted himself for sinners. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took willingly upon him the sin of those who would come to trust in him. That means me. As a sinner, Jesus went to the cross and took upon himself all my sin, past, present, and future. And Jesus Christ, God, who was a man, died in my place for my sins, paying my debt to God and purchasing my salvation. Jesus' dead body was then laid in a tomb, and for three days he was buried. On the third day, a Sunday, which is why we worship on that day, Jesus rose in victory over Satan, sin, death, demons, and hell. And he commissioned us with the Holy Spirit to be missionaries telling this amazingly good news that there's a God who passionately, lovingly, continually, relentlessly pursues us. And he ascended into heaven and today Jesus is alive and well. And he's seated on a throne and he is ruling and reigning over all nations and all cultures and all philosophies and all races and all periods of time. And he is King of Kings and he is Lord of Lords and he is ruling and reigning over all people, commanding everyone everywhere to repent of everything. And he is coming again to judge the living and the dead and those who trust in him will enjoy eternity in his kingdom of heaven forever. And those who do not will suffer apart from him in the conscious eternal torments of hell. That is what we believe. We believe in Jesus.